Dr. Douglas Beck, thank you so much for being here. I just want to ask you a couple of questions about the upcoming Cognition and Audition Summit that you and I are hosting together in Dallas on October 13th. First off, and and this, this should be quick if possible, why are cognitive screenings so important in audiology and in hearing healthcare? So, so I've got uh, 816. Have you got two hours? <laughs> Why are cognitive screening so important in hearing healthcare? Well, um, because when you go back to the history of audiology and, and you look at hearing versus listening, people generally don't know when they have hearing loss, right? We, we know there's 38 million Americans who have hearing loss about probably three fourths of those are undiagnosed because people just get used to the sensory perception they have. Okay. And, and unless it's causing a major problem, they don't, they, they don't seek help for something that they don't perceive as a problem. But then you have this other issue of listening disorders. And this could be ADD, ADHD, auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder. It could be cochlear synaptopathy. It could be um, mild cognitive impairment. It could be major neurocognitive uh, disorders. It could be traumatic brain injury. It could be a million things. And there's 26 million Americans in, that, that have uh, listening disorders without any hearing loss whatsoever. So, so this becomes the issue. If you have a listening disorder or if you have hearing loss and, and you're having trouble communicating, you can't tell what people just said, you can't remember what's going on uh, in a conversation, um, you, you immediately s- suspect, because it's the easy reach, is to say, well, this is it's probably hearing loss, right? Well, um, but, but it could be lots of other things. It could be auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder, auditory processing disorder, cochlear synaptopathy, ADD, ADHD, mild cognitive impairment, traumatic brain. It could be all those things and more. And one of them does not protect you from having the other. So, so what we've learned in audiology since Michael Bus in 1949, Michael Bus made this point that um, these are not silos. Wait, 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 1949. I thought cognition and audition was only around for the past 10 years, Doug. Uh, yeah, no, not so. But it's an old story, right? And and Michael Bus was writing in JSHR back, you know, uh, seventy years ago that these are not silos. It's not that you you have one thing that you have a listening disorder, so you just deal with that, or you have just hearing loss. So these things are intricate and they're interwoven, and so. For us in 2022, for hearing care professionals, it's increasingly more important to really ferret out what is the actual diagnosis because you get to any medical school in in the world and it's diagnosis first, treatment second. And what we do is we presume that we know the answer based on mild to moderate sensory neural loss or a simple pure tone test. And there's so much more to it. So, um, So that's why it's important because when you have difficulty in communication, the question becomes, is it... Uh, as simple as outer hair cell loss, like mild to moderate sensory neural hearing loss, or is it more complicated, like a listening disorder, or is it more complicated still, like a neurocognitive disorder? And then you have neurocognitive disorders from mild cognitive impairment, which is actually referred to now as a mild neurocognitive disorder, to major neurocognitive uh, disorders, which could be, you know, um, a Lewy body disorder. It could be Parkinson's with dementia. It could be frontotemporal. It could be uh, Alzheimer's. Those, those are all major neurocognitive developments. And the beautiful thing is for us, for you, for me, for the people coming to Dallas, for, for hearing care professionals everywhere, the beautiful thing is that many people can be helped if you catch these things early. You can train change the trajectory based on better sensory input. Sometimes, not every time, not every patient, but sometimes if you catch it early, you can change the way things are going to go for that patient. And and of course, you have the 2020 Lancet, which Dr. Livingston and his colleagues wrote about 12 modifiable risk factors. If you catch this stuff early, communication disorders often are the first red flag. And if you catch it early, those 12 modifiable risk factors, that makes up 40% of your dementia risk. 60% of your dementia risk is due entirely to DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, sure. genetic pattern. You can't do much about that. But the other 40%, almost half, you might be able to modify it through clever and meaningful modifications. Right. Through through treating hearing loss, which can improve physical activity and social activity. And I mean, it's sort of I, I believe, right, there's this cumulative effect. And so I, I love that we just got the the three minute synopsis of, of what you'll be speaking about. I'm going to dive in deeper on the neuroscience of sort of the ear to brain connections and what that looks like for somebody who who studied this in the lab who was who was in the lab when the quote unquote hidden hearing loss came out and so you can really understand how it makes sense right like it just 
makes sense that as the year breaks down and, and, you know, we start with a finite number, there's only about 60,000 neurons that connect the ear to the brain. And as they go, you know, we used to think, well, it just impacted the hearing system. But if you really look, the ears are connected to nearly every part of the brain, including memory, executive functioning, the visual spatial. So it makes sense that a decline in one would impact the other. And, and I hope, Keith, that you will cover in your lecture the thalamus, the relay station, where vision and audition and tactile and and um, taste all come together through this relay station that we all learned about in graduate school. And, and when one of those channels is attenuated or blocked or impaired, the, the entire perception of the brain is altered because it's not getting the same sensory input. So there's, there's been a big change at Cognitive View recently, which, which is great. And so I want to ask you, in your mind, who's welcome at this event, right? Because for a long time, it was, well, maybe only the audiologist should be dealing with audition and cognition and cognitive screenings, but that's recently changed. So tell me about that. But what we've realized, you know, through our research and development, through the publications that are coming out globally in the peer-reviewed literature, it's not just for one individual profession. You know, when you think about hearing care professionals, there's at least three that come to mind, right? You have hearing aid dispensers, you have audiologists, you have otolaryngologists, and there's much more. I mean, there are, there, you know, when you think about just otolaryngology, of course, you have otology, you have neurotology. When you think about... Um, um, hearing care offices, you could have different levels of um, audiometric technicians and you could have all of these people. And, and cognitive health is not the purview of one particular profession. It used to be that late in the game, right, when somebody has clear dementia, somebody has um, Alzheimer's, somebody is unable to take care of themselves anymore, they, they, they're, they're in, in a difficult situation, we would send them to psychiatry or neuropsych or we'd send them to psychology. And that's that's great. That's beneficial sometimes. That can really help. But that's very late in the game. And what we've realized, I have a brand new paper I'm, I did with Jed Grissel that'll be coming out in the Journal of Otolaryngology ENT Research. I think it's September of 22, where we look at sensory clinics and we look at the difference through optometry, through audiology, through, you know, who are the people that are most likely to see uh these patients early on. And these are the sensory, you know, sensory and air quotes, sensory clinics, like hearing, like vision, the people with those deficits and how it impacts their social, uh, their, their ability to socialize, their, their professional relationships, their personal relationships. And, and so we argue in that paper that, you know, uh, all of these sensory type clinics are, are make, make good sense that that's where you should be doing the screenings. And very possibly that's where you should be offering the first level of rehabilitation. So I think, I think what you're getting at, and you've sort of hinted at it now a couple of times, catch it early and treat it early, right? Yeah, yeah. That is the early detection. I mean, you hear it talked about all the time in, in every single medical disorder. I think now we're finally starting to jump on board with, it's really important to catch it early and treat it early to prevent all of those bad comorbid things that could come, be it falling, be it cognitive decline, hospitalization, oh, sure, so, sure. so on and so forth. And so I, I love what you said, which is this event really is open to all frontline hearing healthcare providers, which includes the audiologist, which includes the hearing instrument specialist, which includes the ENT, which is why I think it's great that we have an ENT on our panel speaking that day. And, and it includes speech language pathologists. When you think about it, you know, a, a very dear friend of mine, uh, Kathy Dowd, who's involved with the audiology project in diabetes, right? She talks about this all the time, that there are some speech language pathologists, unfortunately, who are doing cognitive screening and cognitive rehab, and they've never done a hearing test. So it's like, well, how do you, you, you know, diagnosis first, right? Treatment second. This is not new. This is the proper way to take care of patients. It's very, real, very well established in all of our uh, journals and all of our professional practices. Uh, and, and yet to see somebody with a language disorder or a processing disorder or a listening disorder and not have a full diagnosis, how, how do you know what the real problem is? You're treating the symptoms. And what we want to do is treat the actual problem. So, so yeah, I think, and, and 
Yeah, if I could take it a step further, I know this is supposed to be brief, but I think it's really time for primary care and GPs. Now, they, they are strapped for time. You know, their time for patient is like nothing. They don't have time to do any of this work. So it's not surprising that you have 50 million people on the globe, 55 million people now with dementia. And by 2050, you know, just, just really 28 years from now, it's going to be three times that. And we are just not well positioned to manage that unless the whole healthcare team says, oh, Huge problem. We got to get on board because even if we can save, you know, 20 percent, 25, 50 percent, if we can prevent those people from falling um, into a deeper uh, uh, difficulty, that would be glorious. You know, it, it would just be absolutely stunning the impact we can have by catching these things early. Now, the one thing is we can't make any promises for any person at any time. We can say there are many, many research studies that indicate yes. that sometimes it works out really, really well. And, and sometimes it doesn't. But we're just at the beginning of this, really, as far as serious professionals getting involved with this to try to determine the candidacy of who is the most likely patient to have the trajectory change through early intervention. And so, I think I think that just to add to that, I think so many of us in hearing healthcare, whatever division you may be in, we have such an advantage that we have more time with our patients, that we can play a real significant role in, in ensuring quality of life and yeah. ensuring that our patients get the absolute most out of it. So, so quickly, the agenda on October 13th in Dallas, uh, Doug, you already gave the three minute synopsis of your talk. I'm going to go through the, the sort of the neuroscience, the sort of what breaks down from ear to brain and how that impacts everything from the thalamus and the sensory systems to executive function and memory. Um, Dr. Jill Davis is actually going to give like a how to, how to integrate cognitive screenings into your bustling audiology practice, right? Because that's what so many people say is, where am I going to fit this? How do I have time? Yeah. I'm telling you, we've got the formula for it. Dr. Jed Grissel will be there. You already mentioned him. Great. ENT uh, in in the Texas area, who's going to come and talk about integrating it into his practice, be it for his hearing aid patients, for his cochlear implant patients. And then what I'm really excited about, there's even a CEU on sort of a demonstration. Everybody, there's going to be a hands-on workshop for about an hour and a half. There's going to be lots of machines there. Yeah where we all get to play a little bit, uh, you know, these, the new video game, and we get to sort of walk through how do you actually talk to a patient, be it introduce them to it, the why, how, the what, and then how do you go through like the recommendations? How do you go through the test results so that so that doesn't appear that you're scaring people or perhaps right. misdiagnosing them. Yeah. I know that that's really important to you. This is such a good point. David Pizzoni's new book came out in 2021, and he talks about... Um, this whole process in terms of information processing. And that's my preference. I really like that a lot because when we talk about cognitive screening and we talk about cognitive rehab, that can be really, really scary, like you said. And But when we talk about it as information processing, how you, not your brain, how you process information, how you remember things, how you prioritize things, how you attend or pay attention to things, these, these are much, much less scary ideas. It means pretty much the same thing, but it's in terms that are much more friendly, you know, and that's a big deal because we don't want to be scaring people away before we've even, uh, you know, shake, uh, shook their hand, right? So <laughs> I, I think that these are, these are all steps in the right direction. We have to make science more available. We have to make um, rehab more available. But b- before we do any of that, Correct diagnosis first, you know. Diagnosis Look, I first. like you. I, I've been to a lot of talks in 2022. I've given a lot of talks in 2022. I genuinely believe this is the most important event of 2022 because it's really kickstarting. I believe the future of hearing healthcare, the role of cognitive screenings, and and the role that we play, and so. If you're out there, you're listening, you're watching, go to cognitivehearingcare.com to learn more, to register. We look forward to seeing you in Dallas. Dr. Beck, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Dr. Darrow. My pleasure.